You know, I was thinking that tonight we should really think about peace. That's what the Lord's laid on my heart to share with you tonight. And so, to do so, let's turn to the 14th chapter of John. John chapter 14. And John chapter 14 records words that the Lord Jesus spoke to the twelve just before his arrest and, of course, crucifixion. Just before those disciples had their world literally turned upside down. And wouldn't you know it, just like Jesus, being so humble and so others-oriented, he's encouraging them. He's equipping them to face the difficulties that are just ahead. Current events, they present us a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, a lot of opportunity to fear. I know I've sensed that in some of you over these last couple of uh, weeks and months. You know, a hundred years ago, bad things happened and it'd be a long time until you found out about them and sometimes you never did. But now, of course, everything can be instantly live-streamed on video in living color. We have to learn how to possess God's peace, not just to make our lives more pleasant, but for the glory of God and for an opportunity to show Jesus in unpeaceful times. And so Jesus shares with his disciples in John 14, I think several important, I call them shalom truths. Truths that bring peace to the heart. He begins that chapter uh, with those famous words, let not your heart be troubled. And if you look down with me uh, to verse 27, he repeats those same words as he ends that verse and adds, neither let it be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If your heart is troubled tonight, if you have feared tonight, Jesus has something to say to you right here. In fact, he has more than that. He has something to offer you. For he says in verse 27, and this specifically is my text tonight, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. He offers, he gives a legacy. He bequeaths a legacy to his people. Peace. Shalom. I want us to pray, and then I want to share some uh, things that relate to this shalom peace that Jesus offers us. So Heavenly Father, once again tonight, if there is anything that is missing from our world, especially at this time, so evident, it's peace. And even when the world talks about peace, they know nothing of this kind of peace because as you've said in this 27th verse, the peace that you give is so different from the peace that the world offers. And I pray that you'll teach us tonight, teach our hearts, let us be receptive to all that you have to say and may it register spiritually with us and, and have a great uh, spiritual impact that lasts. We just thank you for your words, Lord. Here you are. You're going to suffer. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be hung on a tree. You're going to bleed. You're going to suffocate. You're going to die. And yet you're giving out comfort and encouragement and peace to your people. Thank you for that. 
Thank you for being more concerned with other people, others than yourself, even when you're facing the worst conditions imaginable. May we learn from that. We ask in Jesus' name. So I would call your attention in chapter 14 of John's Gospel to the 12th verse because the first truth that I think feeds into this matter of shalom, of God's peace, is to understand what is said in this 12th verse where Jesus says, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, And greater works than these shall he do. And here's the phrase I don't want you to miss. Because I go to my Father. Because I go to my Father. Now, when we open John's Gospel, we come to realize that Jesus, he came from his Father. He came out of the bosom of his Father. His Father sent him, verse 24 says, in this chapter. Now he is saying in this 12th verse that he is going back following his crucifixion and resurrection he is going to ascend back to the Father and to properly understand what Jesus is saying and and what the the importance of this little phrase because I go to my Father what the importance of that is you have to discern the difference between Jesus' earthly humility and his heavenly glory. The difference between Jesus' or the Messiah's earthly humiliation and the Messiah's heavenly exaltation. There's a big difference between the two and probably no better is it to explain than in the book of Philippians chapter 2 where Paul says that you and I, as believers, should have the same mind in us that Christ had. And he gives us a glimpse of that mind. He says, Messiah, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of of man, or men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, he says, should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So you see the the contrast between Messiah's earthly humiliation and his heavenly exaltation all pictured there for us. His earthly life was a life in which he purposefully limited himself, but his heavenly exalted life, which he now has, is full of infinite possibility. Highly exalted. No limitations. Messiah defeated all his enemies and all of our enemies in his death and resurrection and ascension. And today, he rules supreme in control over heaven and earth. He himself says, all authority, all power over heaven and earth resides in me. And when you look at what's going on in current events or in your troubled life or whatever it is that is troubling your heart, when you look at those things in light of this, if you believe that despite how bad things currently look, that Jesus is exalted and that he is a supreme ruler in control of everything, let me tell you, you will begin to experience some of God's shalom in your life because he's enthroned. And that's the key word. 
in verse 12. Because I go to my Father means because I'm enthroned. Because I'm sitting on the throne as Lord of all. But there's a second truth that really feeds into this peace that Jesus bequeaths as a legacy to his people. And it's found in verse 26 of chapter 14, where he says, well, let's, in, before we go to chapter, uh, verse 26 of this chapter, let's drop back a little bit and uh, let's look at verse uh, 16. Jesus says, I'm going away. But I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, capital C, that he may be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, that's who the comforter is, whom the world can't receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you currently, and at Pentecost, will be in you. That's what he says here in that 17th verse. And then drop down to verse 26. But the Comforter, capital C, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Here's the second key word that really fits into this peace that Jesus promises his people. Not only that he's enthroned, but that you and I are inhabited. That we're inhabited. Messiah is physically leaving, but he's not leaving spiritually. He's going to abide with us forever, he says, through his substitute, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who I believe one of his greatest functions is, as Jesus says in verse 26, to bring truth to our minds and give us understanding of that truth that we would ever realize how dependent we are upon the one that inhabits us, upon the indwelling Holy Spirit, to teach us the meaning of the Bible, to bring the Bible truth to our, uh, our, our memory, to our mind at just the right time when we need it most. We have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. As you regularly read your Bible, I hope you at least do that, as you regularly read your Bible, do so depending upon the Holy Spirit, as you regularly study your Bible, as you meditate upon the truth in the Bible, as you memorize the Bible, you depend upon the Holy Spirit for that. Don't tell me I can't memorize the Bible. The Holy Spirit can enable you to do that. You're just too lazy and you don't want to. Let's be honest about it. The Holy Spirit, you depend upon Him to memorize. And also, I think, interpret the Bible. You interpret the Bible by interpreting the Bible by the Bible. Let the Bible explain itself. Let the Holy Spirit, as you depend upon Him, interpret the Scriptures, as you depend upon Him to discuss the Scriptures that you have been thinking of, and you share the Scriptures. This is all what we're talking about. That's how it applies to us in that 26th verse. You're inhabited by the author of the book, and this is what you can do. And if you do so, the Holy Spirit will bring truth to your mind that you'll be able to claim, that you'll be able to apply at the moment you need it. And when you do, you will experience what is called the fruit of the Spirit. Peace is peace. Third thing, and this is where we get to really our text, verse 27, is what I call the word endowed. We have peace because he's enthroned. We have peace because we're inhabited. But we also have peace because we're endowed by the Messiah. Now, some historic churches 
that have massive buildings and few members attending continue to exist only because former wealthy members or current wealthy members leave money to these churches called endowments that will perpetually put money into the coffers to care for these big buildings, these massive edifices, and keep the thing going even when you only have a handful of people meeting in them. A lot of these historic churches, for instance, in New York City, are heavily endowed. Well, what we have here in verse 27, Jesus says, you know what I'm going to leave with you? I'm going to endow you with my peace. Jesus endows every believer with his peace. Two questions that I want to attach to that. What is this peace? Is the first question. What is it? And then how do you get it? Well, first of all, if you look again at verse 27, you'll see that his peace is so unique. It's so different. It's different from the world. You know, you know what the world's peace looks like? Let me give you just a few examples. The world's peace is transcendental med meditation. The world's peace is yoga, or some type of physical exercise, or some false religion that you follow, or maybe some type of psychological counseling, or the world's peace sometimes is prescription drugs, or illicit drugs, or alcohol. That's the world's brand of peace. This peace that Jesus says is so different. The world's peace is based on good circumstances and being in agreement together on everything and certain conditions being fulfilled. And the world's peace comes and it goes, but God's shalom is unique. My peace, he says, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. It is not as the, the, the peace that the world gives. My peace, notice, it's Jesus' very own peace that we are endowed with. That, I think, ought to say something. The same peace that Jesus possessed and the same peace that Jesus tonight possesses is the peace that he endows you and I with. Does that mean that Jesus never was troubled? Well, we'll see that in a moment. But uh, his peace is unique. It's, he says, my peace I give you. In other words, it's never going to end. It's perpetual. And you know what? It's miraculous. The peace that Jesus gives us is a supernatural peace. It's a miraculous peace. It's infinite. It's never going to run out because it's his peace. But here's the thing that really makes it so different from the world's peace and from what the world calls peace. And it's this. It's internal. It is that which Jesus fills your inner person with. And so it's unchanged by changing circumstances. It's like when Jesus showed up in that upper room after the resurrection. All of a sudden, doors locked. There he is in the midst. Peace be unto you. Shalom. The peace that Jesus endows us with is peace in which he shows up in our inner man and he says, Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Inside our hearts. Peace be unto you. It's an inner thing. He enters... He infuses a great settled rest in him into our inner life so that we can be composed, so that we can be uh, unirritated, so that we can be without fear and uh, without anxiety and without worry. I listened to a, a clip, a uh, video clip uh, a day or two ago 
of the testimony of the new press secretary. And she was saying how she felt so nervous when she had her first press conference. I'm sure she still does, but especially the first one. And uh, she called her, her mom and her parents to, to pray with her. And she called friends and, and asked them to, to pray with her. And she had a little prayer session with some of the believers there uh, in the White House before she went out for that first press conference. And she said, after we were done praying, a, a, a peace just settled on me. And I had composure. And I knew it wasn't me, it was the Lord answering my prayer. So this is what it is. This is the endowment here that Jesus, how do you get it? It's Jesus' legacy. He says in that 27th verse, I I'm going to leave it with you. I'm going to bequeath it to you. It's going to be my endowment to you. And uh, I give this peace. In other words, it's, it's a gift. It's an endowment that money can't buy, and even if there was money that, that uh, could be put towards it, it would never be affordable. Because it's not a program that you need to pay into. It's a free gift. It's, it's, it's God's shalom, and it's available to any and all Christians. Just like a gift inheritance, it's no good unless you claim it. You could uh, be the heir of a huge fortune. But unless you claim it and take it as your own, it does you no good at all. Same with this. This is the endowment of every child of God. Jesus is peace. But if you don't claim it, if you don't take it, your head could be all messed up. Your life could be in, in shambles. You'll be just filled with anxiety and worry and fear. But you don't have to be if you claim your endowment, if you take advantage of the inheritance that is yours, that Jesus promises to any and all Christians. And there's three dimensions to this peace. First of all, there is what the Bible calls peace with God, and that's really the basis, the foundation for claiming it. Before you have this kind of peace that Jesus promises to believers, you got to be a believer. And you become a believer by coming into peace with God. And that's very clear that this peace is not yours, it's not your endowment, until first of all, you've made peace with God. And how do you make peace with God? Very simple. The Bible says that we make peace with God by simple faith in what Jesus did for us when he suffered and bled and died for our sin on that tree. We are justified in the eyes of God. We're declared righteous in God's eyes by faith in the shed blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus the Messiah. That gets you peace with God. But what Jesus is promising here is the peace of God. So it begins by claiming peace with God, and it continues by then claiming the peace of God. Notice, this peace that Jesus endows us with is not detached, or aloof, or indifferent, or ignorant of current events or life's problems. Jesus he was well aware of what was going on around him and showed human emotions at times. He is said to be troubled or to be grieved, which tells me that this peace that we're endowed with isn't automatic. You have to bring your human emotions under the control of the Holy Spirit to not let that trouble stay inside you. Notice the... Uh, Verse 27 in the last sentence, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't let that stay inside you, a troubled heart. You got to bring it under, you got to exchange your fear, you got to exchange your worry, you got to exchange your anxiety or your anger or whatever it is. 
for the Holy Spirit's fruit, which is Jesus' peace. And the same way that you get peace with God is the way that you get the peace of God, by faith. You claim it, you take it by asking, by receiving. And if you don't, like any endowment, it's worthless to you. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be filled with anxiety and worry. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And here's what's going to happen. The peace of God that is beyond human comprehension, understanding, that surpasses understanding, will keep, it's the word guard, will perform guard duty on your heart and mind, will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Don't let your thoughts, don't let your anxieties, don't let your fears and your worries and your anger just run rampant in your thought life. Exchange it for Jesus' peace. And included with this peace of God is peace with others. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 talks about the enmity, the hostility that naturally existed between the Jew and the Gentile. But in Jesus the Messiah, all that hostility is erased and Jew and Gentile come into a loving brotherhood, a family of God. They become one in Jesus the Messiah. I remember as a little boy a couple of times hearing stories of World War II Japanese soldiers that were still hiding in the jungle because either they were ignorant that the war had ended or they didn't believe it had ended when people told them so. And as a result, they were not able to enjoy the peace that had been established at the end of the war. Which reminds me, and uh, of course, the fear, the anxiety, the anger will prevent you from experiencing and enjoying God's shalom that Jesus promises here. And because of that, you'll not be at peace with others. If you're not at peace with God, if you as a believer do not have the peace of God, you'll not have peace with others either. You'll not be a peacemaker. And that's who God says are his children. The children of God are peacemakers, according to Matthew 5, 9. But anger and anxiety are described by someone as a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind, and if encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Is that a description of you? If so, it doesn't have to be. Jesus, who ascended, sent his Holy Spirit, and he wants us to depend upon him that we might experience Jesus' peace that he gives for all your troubled times. You'll please forgive me again for taking another illustration from Ravi Zacharias, but uh, I've been uh, thinking about his passing and I've been thinking about some of the great illustrations that he's used through the years. He often repeated them. But he had so much opportunity that a lot of people didn't, unique opportunities, one of which he was invited along with other religious leaders to sit down at, uh, at a bargaining table uh, between Israel and uh, the Palestinians for peace talks. And uh, finally, the came, uh, it came uh, time for him to speak. And he was asked to say something, and he looked over at this sheikh that uh, was one of the leaders of Hamas. I forgot his name, Sheikh Galil, I think. But he said to him, Sheikh Galil, he said, you and I both know that about 5,000 years ago, not very far from here, Abraham offered the sacrifice of his son on that uh, mountain. Now, you say it's Ishmael, we say it's Isaac, but 
that doesn't matter. That's not the point. What God did when Abraham was about to bring that knife down into his son was stop him and promise God will provide himself a lamb. And shake 2,000 years ago, God took his own son and on a, another hill, not too far from here, he offered up his son for us all. And shake until you and I receive the son that God's provided. We both will be offering our own son on the world's battlefields for land and for possessions and for power and in pride. Can we apply that to our current world and our current national situation? Until both sides, whatever those sides might be, come to accept God's Son that was sacrificed for all mankind on that hill called Calvary. We'll be offering up our own children our own generation and future generations in hateful skirmishes and battles. My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Our Heavenly Father, use this in our hearts, help us to reflect upon your promise to us as the enthroned one who has inhabited us and as a result you have endowed us with your very peace. And you are our peace. And we take tonight and thank you that you undertake in Jesus' name.